song service. If you'd like to read along with me, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through uh, 4. Talk to you this morning about the essential aspects of the gospel of Christ. And I know it's Easter and we, we celebrate the, the resurrection that, and the writer inspired of God is going to emphasize the resurrection later in this text because uh, the people at Corinth had, I mean some of them had misapplied or misunderstood or rejected the fact that of the resurrection itself and you know, what the writer inspired of God did is to correct those things that were wrong in the brain and the mind of of the readers here. I cannot know what's on your mind. This may be a good thing. I figure I can't read mine, body mind. I try to read faces sometimes, but that don't really work well either, because some of y'all are awful sad looking some days. I don't I don't really know what that means or not. But, but the facts are is that the gospel has three essential elements. And he spells them out in this text. And let's read it together. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which you are also you are saved. If you keep in memory that which I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, that how Christ died for our sins according to scripture that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to scripture so he says there's three basic elements to the gospel and that is the death of Christ for our sins according to scripture his burial according to scriptures as well and his resurrection according to scripture those three elements and Later on, he's going to emphasize the resurrection because there were some there that had said there was no resurrection. I want to kind of cover all three with you this morning and as uh, brief as I can and as precise. It is important that you believe all three elements. He names all three elements. The death of Christ according to Scripture for our sins. The fact that Jesus went to the cross and died, <coughs> he died a particular way for a particular reason. And it is important that me and you understand and comprehend that. The death of Christ is important <coughs> to us. It should be. Especially to a believer. The Bible says that it's through his death that me and you have a right standing with God. <coughs> It is whereby we stand justified because he went to the cross and he died a terrible death and he paid our sin debt. The idea is that he went to the cross and he died for our sins in relation to those sins, because of those sins. It has been said it's the day he wore our crown. Uh, ever since the Garden of Eden, after man had failed God, God had promised a redemption. To be brought back into harmony with God. To be brought back into place where God and man could get along. Many times uh, over the years I've been asked how much of the Bible I have to believe to be saved. And I've tried to emphasize to people that you're going to have a hard time getting along with God if you call Him a liar about half the time. You and him are going to have a hard time having harmony. I know if you, me and you, have a relationship and you think I'm lying to you about half the time, me and you ain't going to get along very well, are we? And that's true with God. Man has a transgression problem. The Bible says he was delivered for our transgressions. That means that we have a tendency to go over the line. That we miss the mark. 
that God has a standard and me and you have not met that standard. That we, if you're talking about accuracy, uh, I grew up in rural Arkansas and we had our pastime was shooting stuff. And I was I, I spent a lot of money one time on a on a rifle, my first one of my first varmint rifles, and and I was disappointed when it wouldn't shoot a hole in a hole. And then I discovered that, that accuracy for man is not hole in holes. It's if you can shoot one in a pretty good group, you're doing well. Any gun that way. Not a hole in a hole. It's very rare many guns ever shoot a hole in a hole. And it's very rare any man is able to do it without great help. What our problem is that God has given us a standard, me and you have missed that standard greatly. And because we have missed that standard, because we have missed the mark, because we have came up short, because me and you have transgressed God's commands, His laws, His expectations, God had determined that if a man did certain things that he would suffer because of those things. The Bible says for the way to the sin is death. That means eternally cut off from a righteous God. That's what that term death means. It means God had predetermined that if a man did certain things, missed the mark, that he would be cut off from him. That he would die in his sin. But God determined that he didn't want that. According to the book of 2 Peter, that God is not willing that any should perish but all should come to repentance. God's perfect will was that man not suffer that. That man not go down that path, not go down that road, and that he would have a redemption process where man could be brought back into harmony with God. That text, the wages of sin and death, has a second part. And it says, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus. You can be brought back into harmony. Man's sin problem had a solution. The solution was that God was going to send a person in the name of Jesus to earth. He's going to live a perfect life in perfect harmony with the Father. And this sinless individual was going to go to the cross and die a terrible death. And by that, he was going to reconcile, make reconciliation for man. That he would suffer what man deserved. If you may or may not understand this, but when you look at the cross and what happened on the cross of Calvary, the death of Christ, the manner in which he died, how he died, it was supposed to, and it did, satisfy God's demands as a punishment for sin. Isaiah said he saw to travail of his soul and he was satisfied. It was Jesus Christ taking our punishment to himself, <laughs> him suffering for me and you. That God poured out on him the wrath of us all. He suffered that I would not have to. A preacher friend of mine was trying to demonstrate this to his young son. Someone taking the punishment for another. And so his son got in terrible trouble. Did something unspeakable. And he went in there with a belt. I know sometimes in today's culture there's an idea that you ought not look people and people ought not have punishment. But Listen, y'all think that's working for us, I'll give you a prize. Okay? 
But he thought he would try to show that there must be somebody that pays the price. <clears throat> and so he went in there with a the belt and handed the belt to his son. And he bent over and let his son whoop him. I'd like to say that worked out well for him, but his son enjoyed that too much. He didn't actually get the lesson. If you understand the death of Christ, you would understand that God substituted Jesus Christ for me. He just substituted Jesus Christ for you. He took what you deserved, he placed it on the Son, then your wrath he poured out on the Son so you could go free. The best substitute you'll ever get. Okay? That I don't have to suffer for that which I have failed. God sent His Son to suffer for me. Jesus died for our sins according to Scripture. Now His death was gruesome in order to do two things. One, it tells me just how bad my sin was. If you don't think sin was bad and you don't think you've done anything wrong, I want you to do a great examination of the cross and the type of nature of Christ's death. They did things to him that they didn't do to others, typically. They planted on him a crown of thorns, put over his head that he was the king of the Jews. He was mocked and ridiculed, uh, spit upon. He hung on a cross for many hours, suffering. And if you don't understand how death came from crucifixion, it was from a variety of ways, but typically it was through suffocation. Because as you may or may not know this, but take a breath, you have to pull up and take a breath. If you're over a course of time on a tree, being nailed to it, exhaustion occurs. If they wanted them to die early and quickly, they broke their legs. That's what they did to the other two thieves on the cross. They broke their, their legs in order to bring suffocation rapidly and quickly. When they came to Jesus, he had already expired. Now I know that might sound gruesome, but that was what your sin did to him. You need to see that. <coughs> see deep down to him. Your freedom wasn't free. Jesus Christ suffered tremendously that I could be right with God. That I could stand before Him spotless and clean. Jesus Christ suffered all those things. But not only this, the crucifixion did certain things. It, it, it paid man's sin debt, but most of the time we don't think of much about the burial. It, it is what is stacked between death and the resurrection most times. We don't understand the significance of the fact that he was buried or how he was buried. The Bible is really saying he's buried according to the scriptures in this text. You may not know this nor realize this, but most people who were crucified in the manner which Jesus was and the thieves were were not given proper marriage. <coughs> There's a text where Jesus talks about a place called hell. And one of the words he uses for that Describes a place outside Jerusalem. 
It was a place where in the Valley of Hinnom they had the city dump. <clears throat> now, I realize we have sophisticated city dumps today. All right? When I was a kid, we had a community dump, and it wasn't sophisticated. Okay? Everybody brought anything, and they throwed it down there, and you'd go down there, and there'd always be some stinky fire going that didn't smell so good. The place he used to describe hell was the city dump of Jerusalem. It is most likely, most likely, that the two thieves that died with him was taken from them crosses, taken down to the city dump, and thrown in it. Nobody would come and beg for the body of a thief to have a proper burial. They just picked them up, took them down there, and chunked them in. When Jesus chose to describe hell, that's what he used, term he used to describe it. Somebody taken and taken the city dump and chunked in. And there was always a fire there. Jesus was not done that way. There was a man went and begged for his body to have it turned over to him. And he took that body, he took it and put it in his tomb and buried it in a proper way. You may not realize that, but that's remarkable. Remarkable. And he was buried in a rich man's tomb. A tomb that no man had ever been in before. A tomb that was designed by a righteous God for him to go into. His burial represented a plan. The writer later on in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 argues about what it means to die and be buried. He says it's like a planting a seed. Some of y'all plant, plant gardens, right? How many of y'all expect to get more out of a garden than you put into it? If you didn't, I hope you didn't plant. Right? You had a choice when you had a seed. You could either take that seed and it abide alone, or you put it in the ground and it bring forth much fruit. Jesus said, if some, except a man die, he abideth alone. Same is true for a seed. You the expectation is that you put it in the ground, it comes up, and it produces many fruit. That is exactly what God expected. God expected to, for Jesus to die, for him to be planted for three days, and for him to rise again and bring him forth much fruit. The Bible says he is the first fruits of them that slept. He is supposed to be the example, not the exception. You need to understand. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is supposed to bring man hope in this life and the life to come. You'll find that death and burial is an essential part of Christianity. To understand what that means. Dying to oneself and giving up what my own desires is are what I would like in life. To give them up for him. Jesus says if you do that you will not abide alone. A unique burial. Buried in a rich man's tomb. Untypical for what happened to people who died on crosses. The last part of that is this. He was risen again according to the scripture. Now most Easter's we focus on this essential element. The resurrection he is. 
And while the burial is skipped over most of the time, I just want to answer a few questions for you. Uh, when he was in the tomb, his spirit was in heaven, by the way. Uh, some people have some strange ideals. He told the thief with him on the cross, despite the thief probably going and getting thrown bodily in the fire of Gehenna, he said, this day thou, spirit, shall be with me in paradise. That's where him and the thief went. Though well, their bodies went somewhere else. The resurrection marked a victory. Jesus Christ conquered death, hell, and the grave. It could not hold him. I love that song, Victory in Jesus. The Bible says that our last enemy one day will be done away with, and that is death. There's going to be one day it's coming and I'm never going to have to do a funeral again. I'll never have to look into the sad eyes of a family that has said goodbye. I'm looking forward to that day. Funeral director asked me one time about doing funerals and I said, I don't volunteer for this. I've done a lot of my own family's funerals and I told them if they wouldn't be a resurrection, they wouldn't be in Christ, that didn't die for me, y'all couldn't get me around here. <clears throat> I want you to understand that the resurrection is sure. And if you know Jesus, yours is as well. The resurrection of Christ was supposed to bring man to the place where he knew that eternally he was secure. The problem with the Corinthians is that they was having a difficult time because some people say it is easy. I want you to understand that Christianity is more than just about this life. It has to be about the life to come. Paul said if we only had hope in this life, we're of all men most miserable. Folks, if the last year ain't taught you anything, you ought to know we ain't going to get out of this deal alive. And death is unexpected. A preacher friend of mine I told you about passed away this week. He'd been doing the same thing most of his life. Probably done what he was doing before. I have news for you. Death can come to anyone at any time. <clears throat> Most of you are planning on living past the day. I have news for you. Some of y'all have planned out a long time in the future. I didn't realize how much I had planned out a long time in the future until my wife sent me down one, more, one day at the hospital and told me I had cancer. I realized I planned on living long. Even though I had preached for years that life was but a vapor that appeareth a little while and vanished away, that day it hit me hard that life is but a vapor that appeareth a little while and vanished away. You know how long your lifespan is? It's short. It can come to the young. It can come to the not so young and it can come to the old. And it has no... And it won't make an appointment for you with you what day it's coming. Uh, I always kid some people, you know, they're late for everything. Where's Miss Diane at? I know one thing she'll never be late for. But I know it'll be on God's time. For years I said I would rather do funerals than weddings. You know why? I know what day they'll come apart. It's in God's time. Weddings, I have no clue. Some of them I've done, it was for better for worse, but not for long. <laughs> I mean, the bill outrun the wedding. Just about.
the resurrection, you knowing who Jesus is, you knowing that your life is secure in Him, whether it's in this life or the life to come, because I have news for you. It ain't over when you breathe your last breath here. You're going to go somewhere. For those who with don't receive the Son, Jesus described that place. He used the term Gehenna to describe that place. Gehenna was the city dump of Jerusalem. They had a visual they could go out and look at and understand what hell was all about. Y'all understand that? A friend of mine said his uncle used to, every Sunday, when he would preach, he would have his church members look into the pits of hell and see what they escaped. You might want to think about that every now and then. Right? Especially when we talk about and value who Jesus is. I'm glad I'm not going there. Amen? Amen. I'm glad you're not. I don't want nobody to go there. The great thing is that God didn't want anybody to go there either. Y'all know that? That God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. His plan was, I'm going to send my son. My son is going to die a terrible death in the pavement of man's sin. And man will understand that I love him. Man will repent and turn to me and I'll bring him back into harmony with me and they'll live forever with me for eternity. That was God's plan. If man would only respond to him in the right way to receive his son. That's simple, right? Salvation is easy. The person that makes it hard is me and you. Some people try to make it difficult to be saved. It's simple. You repent, turn to Christ, you'll have eternal life. It's that simple. A child can do that. I've seen children do it. Unfortunately, as the older a person gets, the more objections they come to have. Sin has a tendency to blind them, to make them contrary to God. This morning I'm going to plead with you. If you do not have an eternal home in heaven, provided by the death, burial, and resurrection of the Son, you need to respond in a great way in terms of the Son for eternal life. That is the only way men escape, women escape, children escape, a place called Gehenna. This morning I plead with you, turn your life over to him. The resurrection is real. Jesus surely lives. He can give you everything that you need from here on out that pertains to this life and the life to come. If you'll respond to him in the appropriate way, that is, come just as you are. Uh, I have had some people who wanted to try to clean up themselves, then show up. I have news for you. God don't need your help. He wants you just as you are. You come to him as you are. You turn to him, and he does the rest. Pretty simple. This morning, I plead with you to respond to him. Jesus leads. He actually conquered death, hell, and the grave. A victory. You know, most of us like winning, right? I have never met anybody that said, I like losing. Ever. We like winning. 
You can be a winner with Christ. You can win in the circle of life with Christ Jesus. And it don't matter what else happens in life. Your Christian life should be viable. People ought to be able to see it. Be tangible. Years ago, there was a man who fought for the heavyweight champion of the world. His name was George Foreman. That was it. And before he had received Christ, he had already won the heavyweight champion of the world. I think he won a gold medal in the Olympics. And his testimony was that the best thing that ever happened to him was Jesus Christ. After he became a Christian and became a preacher, he continued to box. And a man asked him one time, how can you be a boxer and a preacher at the same time? Or a Christian. George Foreman said, here, hold my Bible and I'll throw a left jab and you'll find out. <laughs> Some of y'all need more tangible things in your life about Christianity. You need to be able to hold on to it. Grab a hold of it. I assure you, Jesus is real. Your Christianity can be real too. You don't have it. Don't, and this is the sad thing about Easter. Some people will celebrate Easter, <coughs> and they still won't know who Jesus. Jesus won't be real to you. And it's the saddest thing about celebrating this time. Let's all rise together.